me know. Speak the English. Make the speech. Followed in order by the Virgin Mary manifesting on stage at the Bing in that slow motion shot of Feech Lamana angrily buttering his bread, Tony's somewhat Hitchcockian nightmare at the end of Calling All Cars is easily the most frightening sequence in The Sopranos. Tony starts off in his father's car, driven by Carmelo, while a rotating cast of his mistresses and people he's killed appear in the back seat with him. They eventually stop at an old colonial style white house and we hear frogs and crickets chorusing in the background, a reference to Tony's favorite scene in God. Father too. He follows Ralph Cifaretto up to the house, his expensive clothes falling away, and as he reaches for it, the inner door opens of its own volition, haunted house style. Hello? Hello? I'm here for a mission or job. We see this old woman looming menacingly at the top of the stairs with darkness that seems to seep out and poison the air around her and right as the door slams behind him, Tony wakes up. He wanders around the hotel room looking for an escape and his discomfort here is palpable. You can feel the damp blankets he was just tangled in, taste the stale, heavy Florida motel air. Honestly, I think I could do a whole video just on the ways James Gandolfini conveys emotion through breathing. This is actually part of a series of dreams Tony has throughout the final few seasons, which according to Melfi, represent his desire to square something about the car with Carmella, framed here as Tony's moral compass. Tony's subconscious is, once again, trying to warn him. If this is temptation, and Ralph is the devil, then the place that Tony's following them to, that creepy old house, is hell. Or at least Tony's hell. You can tell because it's hot. And it was hot in the car, it was stuffy. Uh, There's no air conditioning. The heat would have been the first thing you noticed. Hell is hot. That's never been disputed by anybody. And also because this is the same house Kevin Finnerty follows a flash of light to when Tony almost dies at the beginning of season six. It's decked out in lights for some kind of an event now, but it's the same place. Has Kevin Finnerty arrived? We don't talk like that here. What, what do you mean? Your family's in sight. What family? They're here to welcome you. I don't understand. You're going home. I am? You can't bring business in there. What is that? Briefcases aren't allowed. Oh, the, the voice. Please, let me take that from you. Looks like it weighs a ton. I don't want to. Well, you need to. You need to let go. The show I most often see The Sopranos compared with is, well, it's The Wire, and then it's Breaking Bad. And while I haven't seen much of The Wire yet, I am pretty familiar with Breaking Bad, and you really can't overstate the influence that The Sopranos had on that show. In particular, there are scenes in the final season of Breaking Bad I'm entirely convinced were written the way they were specifically because of the way people responded to Tony Soprano. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. Walter White, in almost every respect, is a more sympathetic character than Tony Soprano, but the narrative also makes it so much more clear by the end that he's the bad guy. I remember Vince Gilligan saying this thing while hyping the final season of Breaking Bad, that we want to believe in heaven, but we need to believe in hell. That there's ultimately some kind of an accounting for the injustices that people do to each other. What about the soul? The 
There's nothing but chemistry here. These days, it seems like every drama splits its final season into two parts, and like so many trends in modern television, the roots of this tradition can be traced back to HBO's original masterpiece, Sex and the City, and one of the first shows to hop on that trend was The Sopranos, with the first half of season six essentially being about Tony's commitment to live a better life following his near-fatal shooting, then the second half representing his utter failure to live up to that commitment. The part two opener, Soprano Home Movies, is an episode that deals a lot with damage, and how abusive patterns of behavior can travel down family trees. The Monopoly scene in particular is one of my favorite moments of tension building throughout the entire series. We get these little glimpses into Tony and Janice's childhood and how it was different from the way Bobby or Carmela grew up, symbolized by the community chest thing, the way they learned different rules for playing the game. Janice laughs it off when Tony insults her because that sort of behavior was so normalized where they grew up that she doesn't think of it as over the line. It's significant that the story which started all the trouble took place in a car too, just like the beginning of Tony dream, because if you grew up in a household where uh, tension was prevalent, if your parents didn't like each other, for example, or had unhealthy ways of expressing their anxieties, being trapped in a hot car can stir up a lot of ugly shit. Oh. I can't believe you never told me that story! <sighs> yeah, what's the big deal? Because it makes us look like a fucking dysfunctional family. And I love that Bobby is the one to finally kick Tony's ass, even if he winds up paying for it. This is actually foreshadowed in the episode with Tony's Nightmare, when AJ keeps teasing Bobby Jr. until the younger boy finally snaps and wails on him. Fucking look at him out there. What? I've seen that sitting in the chair thing. This magic moment is heard playing from Bacala's radio while Tony's brooding on getting his ass kicked in front of Carmela because this is the moment where his new philosophy on life is being put to the test. His chance to follow through on that promise and break the cycle of toxic behavior. Tony effectively ruins the one genuinely good person in the family, compromising his niece's gentle, nurturing father by making him kill another innocent person. I look at my key guys, Paulie. Christopher, my brother-in-law. It's number one on their agenda, you know? They're all fucking murderers, for Christ's sakes. The deterioration of Tony's friendship with Hesh in Chasing It is another one of those sequences that really brings us face to face with who he is deep down. Borrowing money from friends is never a good idea, and one of the elements that makes The Sopranos so brilliant is just how human, how real the ugliness can be. When Carmela refuses to gamble the profits from her spec house, Tony sees her as coming between him and the endorphin spike from winning he's become addicted to and turns as nasty as we've ever seen him, using all the intimate knowledge he's acquired being married to Carmela to hurt her her as much as he possibly can. Fact is, you're a shitty businesswoman who built a piece of shit house that's gonna cave in and kill that fucking unborn baby any day. And now you can't sleep. He borrows money from Hesh to cover his losses, and instead of paying it back, just gambles and loses more. At one point, dropping something like 20 grand on a single race, the horse is passing through a sunbeam at the finish line that kind of makes me think of that flash of light Tony kept seeing in his coma. What is that beacon anyway? Oh. Eventually, Hesh starts asking for the money, and when he does, Tony turns so hostile and anti-Semitic it actually makes the other gangsters uncomfortable. Then at the end of the episode, Hesh's wife dies unexpectedly in her sleep, and Tony shows up just to drop off the rest of the money and leave. Hesh is one of the only adults in Tony's life who isn't a rival or an underling or his doctor. Besides Artie, he's probably Tony's only real friend, and Tony was willing to destroy their entire relationship over a debt he could have paid off at any time. He gambles away the money for Vito's family as well, then shows up not to comfort Hesh or to apologize for his behavior, but to see his friend brought low and drop off a bag of cash like some kind of power move. I have been losing. I'm fucking losing right now. Real shitty streak. So your solution is to risk more and make things even worse? When you start chasing it, and every time you get your hands around it, you're full-footed backwards. It's also important to contrast Tony's gambling and the way he treats those around him while he's chasing it with his overt dismissal of Christopher's problems with addiction. This whole disease concept, I think it's bullshit. So you know more than a leading scientist. I know a crutch when I see it. Tony's relationship with Christopher has been a core element of The Sopranos from the first episode. It's one of the first parts of his life he discusses with Melfi, and he's always making a big deal about how he's mentoring his nephew, tutoring him, Christopher about how he's Tony's soldier. Seeing them come to resent and eventually hate each other would almost be heartbreaking if they weren't both such tremendous pieces of shit who get what they deserve. I gotta suffocate you, you little prick. 
I've heard theories that Christopher may have been flipped by the FBI after Walk Like a Man based on that cleaver cap and the way the soundtrack from The Departed is used, but I think that's just meant to show the degree to which their relationship has fallen apart. They're listening to Van Morrison's cover of Comfortably Numb, and Tony looks at Chris just as we hear the words, The child is grown, the dream is gone. So Tony takes the opportunity to kill his nephew, and then the aftermath is essentially a tour of how much of a bullshit artist he is, how convincingly he can simulate grief, then drop it, measured against the genuine reactions of sorrow, anger, and regret felt by everyone else. <laughs> He leaves our granddaughter fatherless. I know I have my differences with that kid. But maybe I didn't do right by him, neither. His mother, my cousin, Joanne, a lush, totally abandoned him as a parent. But now she's reaping all the sympathy and the tears. We also get a stark look at the way Tony uses partial sincerity to manipulate people and comparing his session with Melfi against the dream in which he more honestly recounts his feelings. There have been some hard moments. But a weak lying drug addict who fantasized about my downfall or even showed people his filthy thoughts on a movie screen? Let me tell you something. I've seen friends die before. Accidents. Even murder. My cousin Tony, they shot his face away. And I was fucking prostate with grief. But this? I see. I haven't been able to tell anybody this, but I'm fucking relieved. Really? He was a tremendous drag on my emotions, on my thoughts about the future. The biggest blunder of my career is now gone. And I don't have to be confronted by that fact no more. Let me tell you something. I've murdered friends before, even relatives, my cousin Tony, my best friend, Bush. But this? <laughs> Was I talking to my sleep? Notice, his first instinct upon waking up is to cover himself, make sure he's not seen for what he is. One thing about us wise guys, the hustle never ends. Tony takes a private jet down to Vegas and has a little party for himself, making a beeline for Christopher's Gumar and having sex with her to even the score, in his mind, from when Chris was sleeping with the Jamba Juice lady. And there are just all these little moments down there where we see him enjoying life, appreciating the sight of a cloud or the taste of good wine. He eventually does peyote with Christopher's Gumar out in the desert and hey, there's that flash of light again. One of the things drugs like peyote can do is strip away our pretenses, our ego, and bring us face to face with the experiences that make up the core of our being, with who we are deep down, so to speak. And who Tony Soprano is deep down, beneath all of his rationalizations and his bullshit, is a person who feels nothing but immense joy and relief at the death of a person he claimed to love. A person he held as a baby and helped raise, whom he tutored in the business and thought of as a nephew, even a surrogate son. He's dead. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> we think of time as linear, like a river, each moment flowing into the next, always changing, but that might just be the way we perceive it. If time is static, if our life is like a song and time is the record it's etched upon, then every note, in a sense, goes on forever. Every moment is its own eternity. They say our entire life flashes before our eyes in the moment of death. If our soul is the culmination of our experiences, then it seems to me that this would be the moment when we're at our most complete. And if that's the case, then maybe in that moment we construct our own final destination. And if you're lucky, you remember the little moments. Like this. That were good. 
Maybe we get to live in the moment we entered an amusement park for the very first time, or held our child, or fell asleep in the arms of a loved one. But that doesn't seem to be where Tony, or Christopher for that matter, wind up. Christopher and Adriana mirror Tony and Carmela in a lot of ways, and Christopher also has a nightmare preceding a near-fatal shooting where he seems to visit some kind of an afterlife. You killed me. What do you want me to do about it now? I want to tell you. Tell me what? You come here every night. You fucked up. What do you mean? Here's these. Where did you find them? One in the table, three in my skull. You will have our sausages. Get rid of these. Ah! Let go of me! Let go! To me, this is very evocative of that scene where Christopher shoots the Baker kid in the foot for disrespecting him, which itself was a reference to Michael Imperiali's character in Goodfellas. Christopher's character, his arc I suppose, is all about insecurity. He buys bigger and bigger cars he can't afford, he lashes out violently at people under his power when he feels humiliated, fixates on childhood resentments. He could have been an artist. He had good creative instincts and you could tell how at home he felt on a film set, but he didn't want to put in the time to hone those skills. Christopher's hell is to be that guy behind the counter forever. The little guy. Not respected, not feared, a servant. Like Spider. Salami sub. Hold the mayo. We're out of mayo. So what about Tony? Just like Christopher, he's confronted by the ghosts of those he's murdered, and just like Chris, he's made small and powerless, stripped of his pretensions of authority, his expensive clothes, even his language. They got this machine. He can see images of the brain and how your brain responds to fear. Fear. You see a person listening to a tape of a parent criticizing. I'm talking about an adult, mind you. Their fear center kicks right in. She's a little old lady. Not to you. She's very powerful. Tony's hell, it seems, is to be trapped forever under the same smothering, suffocating influence he's feared all his life. Like a wet, heavy blanket in a hot hotel room where you can't take that fresh gulp of air. He's here for the masoning job because this is the home he built for himself, the punishment he made with his own hands. No, I never told nobody this. But... Why well, was in that coma? Something happened to me, eh? It went someplace. I think. But I know I never want to go back there. 